I should begin by giving you just a little bit of background information about myself. So I grew up moving all over the United States. By the time I was about 15 years old, I'd lived in 10 different places. Now the thing about moving is that mathematics is very, very sequential. And if you fall off anywhere along the way, it can be very hard to get back on. Well, when I was about seven years old, we moved from Texas to Massachusetts. Suddenly, they were far ahead of me in the multiplication tables. Well, here is my little secret. I never liked math anyway. And so what did I do? I just said, well, I, I don't understand what they're doing. And I gave up on learning any more math because it was too hard for me and you know I didn't see any real use for it. And I flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school math and science, which is a little ironic since I am standing here speaking with you today as a distinguished professor of engineering and I love math. So one day, one of my engineering students found out about my terrible, sordid past as a math flunky. And he said, how did you do it? How did you change your brain? And I thought, you know, how did I change my brain? I mean, I was this little girl, and I, I just, I loved animals. I liked knitting and weaving and things like that. I knew I could never grow up and do anything technical. And so I thought, well, here's the thing. What do they call a person who can speak two languages? Bilingual. What do they call a person who can speak one language? An American. <laughs> a North American to be specific. But uh, so I was a typical North American. I could only speak one language and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be awesome to speak two languages like almost everyone here is able to do? And I know you think, oh, it's not that big a deal, but actually it is a big deal because it gives you several different perspectives on the world. But for me, I couldn't afford to go to college. And I, um, so I thought, well, how can I learn another language? There were, weren't a lot of other language speakers around. But uh, I found out there was one way to learn a new language and actually get paid for it. And that was to join the army. So that's me uh, actually about to throw a hand grenade. And if you know, if you knew how clumsy I am, you would know why I was looking so nervous. But I did learn another language at the Defense Language Institute. I learned Russian. I picked it kind of randomly. I should have learned Spanish, obviously, especially since our daughter is married to a Chilean and they speak Spanish at home and our little granddaughter is bilingual. So, but I, I just loved having adventures and seeing the world through different perspectives. So uh, I also did end up at the South Pole Station in Antarctica and that is where I met my husband. And, um, and <laughs> there he is. So I, I sometimes say I had to go to the end of the earth to meet that man. And, and actually, you know what? In two weeks or a little less than that, we're going to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary here in Guatemala. Uh, So he is my hero, and I wouldn't be here without him. But, but in any case, I was, so I was 26 years old, and I was going to get out of the military. And I began to realize that all these, all my colleagues who had been trained in engineering at West Point were easily able to get jobs. But for me, 
you know, I compartmentalized and said, you know, I, I can only maybe learn a language. I can't do anything technical. In fact, I had done what everyone always told me to do. It followed my passion. And my passion had put me in a career box because I hadn't, I, I was selfishly following what I wanted to do, but I wasn't looking at what the world also needed, which of course is what entrepreneurs are always doing. So when I begin to think more entrepreneurially, what do I like to do, but also what does the world need? I thought, well, since I, I'm supposed to be open to new perspectives and new adventures, why don't I see if I can change my brain and learn in math and science? So I went to the university and I started at the lowest possible level of mathematics, which was remedial high school algebra. And I slowly began working my way upwards. It was not easy, but if I had known then what I know now about how to learn effectively, I could have made it a lot easier. So what I'm going to share with you today are some of the dramatic new insights that we're learning from neuroscience, from cognitive psychology, about how you can learn more effectively and be successful in your studies here at UFM. So if you think about it, um, the brain is enormously complex, but the, the foundation of learning is really that building block in the base of the brain, which is the neuron. We have about 86 billion neurons in the brain. And all of these neurons connect together when we're learning uh, the, in little clusters when we're learning new things. So, I wish you could see your faces now. You, you look like, oh no. Here, this is the boring scientific part of the lecture. So let's spice it up a little bit. It can be very helpful to use a metaphor or an analogy for whatever you're learning. So if we want to learn just a tiny bit about how neurons operate, we'll use a space alien as our analogy to help us kind of figure things out. So if you look, our space alien has this big kind of body, that's the body of the neuron, but it has three legs. On a real neuron, those legs are called dendrites. And on those legs, are these little toes. On a real neuron, those are called dendritic spines. And then the, uh, a neuron has this arm that reaches out, and that's called an axon. And that's all you really need to know about neurons. What do neurons do? They like to reach out and kind of play footsie, tickle the toes, of an adjoining neuron. So what, the, what that really means is when you are learning things, you are actually making connections as electronic signals pass along from one neuron, jump that little gap to the next neuron. And when you have these signals kind of connecting these neurons together in a cluster, that relates to what you've learned. So learning is a very physical activity in the brain. It's not all mush up there. Now, as you're learning, when you're learning, you're making these connections, and that involves whatever you are learning. So if you're learning how to take a derivative in math, how to conjugate a verb in English, uh, how to do a dance step, how to play a note or a several uh, chords on the guitar. Whatever you're learning, you're simply making connections between neurons in long-term memory in the neocortex. So how do, you, how do you strengthen what you've learned? 
if you practice, what that practice will do is help to build those connections and strengthen them. So what happens is you, you create this really nice set of neural links, and those links are very easy to pull to mind whenever you might need them. Now what happens if you don't practice? Let's say you go into class and you take notes, you understand what the professor was saying, and then you lead busy lives, don't we all? And you don't have time to look at your notes again for another week or two, and then maybe there's a test. Because you didn't look at your notes and think about what you had learned, here's what happens. Your little synaptic janitors and sweep those things you've learned away because you haven't been using them. So this is why it can be so valuable to look at your notes and try to get the notes in mind. So you're not just looking at them on the page, but you're actually trying to, okay, what was that note? Can I remember those? Uh, what that key idea was? Now this brings me to uh, a question for you. What do you think is the most powerful technique to help you learn effectively? I'm gonna give you four techniques and you can vote. So first, let me just let you know what those four techniques are. Then I'll go back over them and we can vote. So best technique to help you learn efficiently or effectively, First one is rereading. I did a lot of rereading when I was learning engineering. It could be highlighting or underlining. I'll bet you do a lot of that. And then there's retrieval practice or recall, kind of like using flashcards to remember what and see whether you've learned key ideas. Or there's something called concept maps that, that where you you write down key concepts and see how they link together. So four different ways of studying. One of these ways has been shown to be far better than any of the other three. So let's see if you can pick the right one. Okay, so, so you can only vote for one. How many vote for rereading? A few. Okay, we've got a few brave souls here. Okay, I did lots of rereading, so. Highlighting, underlining. Okay, a fair number. How about retrieval practice? Okay, quite a few. And how many for concept maps? Okay, so I think concept maps and retrieval practice seem to be in the foreground. Are you ready? Do you want to know what the real answer is? Well, let's, I'll keep you in suspense. No, okay. So the answer, and this has been shown by hundreds of studies, is that retrieval practice is by far the best. Far better. You can reread stuff, but that can be wasting your time. It, it feels like you're comfortable with the material, but actually it's just, flowing more easily because you've read it a bunch of times. It's not necessarily going into your brain. It's harder to say, oh, you read a section in the book and then you, you go out for a little walk or you look away from the book and say, what was the key idea of that section I just read? That's harder, but you learn better when you do that. And the reason is, when you're first learning something, so for example, I'm presenting something now, you get these weak links in your brain. But then, each time you retrieve those ideas, like you walk away from this lecture and you say, what were the key ideas that she talked about today? You retrieve those key ideas from your own brain, you actually strengthen those sets of links and you also connect them to other ideas. So retrieval practice is an invaluable tool for helping you to learn effectively. So I want to give you just a little example 
Here's, um, this is a, a, a retrieval practice. This is a flashcard system, one of my favorite ones called I Do Recall. And if you look at this, what, um, what it does is you can, you can create these flashcards with the questions, with the answers, and then uh, check whether or not you actually learn that material. What's cool is if you have electronic books, you can import your notes from the electronic book and also ask and create flashcards on that. There's wonderful new ways to integrate chat GPT so it can help you create new flashcards. You can also um, take some of your favorite YouTube uh, channels and using those scripts, easily create flashcards. You can import PDFs and so forth. So it's a, it's a, a great system. And um, what I'd also like to mention are some of the other top apps that are out there. So here's my favorite, but very popular retrieval practice apps are also Quizlet, Kahoot, and the grandmaster of all of them, which is Anki. That's an older system, but it's very comprehensive. So it can be a little clunky to use, but it's, uh, it is maybe the most powerful. So let's talk, let's go to sleep for a moment. Uh, let's talk about the importance of sleep. So you're all budding neuroscientists now. And if you look at this, this is actually a dendrite. That's that leg of the neuron. So you can see the leg is right there. These are little dendritic spines. And this is a living neuron from before, well, it's before learning and before sleep. And then I'm gonna show you the same living neuron, the same dendrite after learning and after sleep. So can you imagine what it will look like do you think that dendrite, the leg, will be fatter? Or am I trying to trick you? Maybe it'll have more dendrites, or dendritic spines, let's see. Actually, if you look, here, there's no dendritic spine before learning before, and before sleep. After learning and after sleep, there's a dendritic spine that emerged. It's making that connection. Now you might say, well, I want to see the other neuron it's connecting to. But we have to give neuroscientists a little bit of a break. It's just really cool that they can get a single living neuron imaged and we can see the components of that. But look at how, for example, right here, there's a dendrite or a dendritic spine that's sticking out here after learning and after sleep, it gets thicker. So there is, it, when you're learning something, it's not just like right now that you're learning something. Tonight when you go to sleep, it will strengthen those connections. So don't give up on sleep. That actually is part of when learning takes place. It's an important part of your day. So, you can kind of think of learning like this. It's, it's not just that you retrieve, it's that you retrieve over a number of days. This is called spaced repetition. So if there is one really important thing that I can convey in this talk today, it's like if you have five hours to study during the week, don't just sit there and go, okay, I'm gonna cram everything in on one day. And uh, I mean, if you do that, it's a weak set of connections that are easily swept away. Instead, if you have those five hours, space them out one hour per day over five days, and that will help you to really build nice solid sets of links. I like to think of learning as like building a brick wall. You layer, layer bricks, mortar, bricks and mortar, and it takes time for that mortar to dry in between so you have a nice solid wall. If you don't take the time, 
you're going to have a very, very poor foundation for learning. So I, I do want to say that um, when it comes to cramming, how many of you have crammed successfully in the past? You can admit it. It's okay. We're all friends here. Okay. So cramming can work, but what it's doing is it's creating those connections in a part of the brain called the hippocampus that has very weak connections. They'll last long enough for you to take the test, but you won't remember it in the weeks and months to come. And that may be when you need it. So spaced repetition builds nice, strong connections in the neocortex where it will stay and you can retrieve them when you need them. It takes time to do this. It's a little bit like it takes time to build the muscular structure you build as an athlete. And it takes time to build that neural structure, but it, it, we can't see inside the brain. So a lot of times people say, oh, cramming, that's easy. You know, uh, that's what I'll do. But you need to take the time to build a good neural structure. So I want to switch gears now very rapidly because um, learning involves many different aspects, just like uh, baking a cake, it involves adding eggs, you know, and then we get the flour, and then what's, what's the temperature of the oven? So lots of different ideas, and a very important aspect of learning is that our brain has two different modes of thinking. We have focus mode, and we have what's called diffuse mode, or mind wandering. So think about it this way. If you, uh, let's say, from an evolutionary perspective, you're a bird, you're, you're trying to peck to, sol you know, to, to eat seeds, but you also have to be aware of everything around you so that if predators approach, you're aware that they're, they're coming. So you have two completely different problems. You have focusing, and you have this wide-ranging activity. It's thought that's why we have two hemispheres. Left hemispheres for focusing. The right and both actually help with mind wandering, looking around and being more aware of what's around you. Our brain goes back and forth between this focused and diffuse modes. When are you uh, focusing? Perhaps when you're focusing on studying a vocabulary list or um, doing a math problem. When are you being diffuse? Ah, you know, you're, you look out the window, maybe, you know, daydreaming about something. When you're taking a shower or you're falling asleep at night, these are all times when you go into this very different mode of thinking. To better understand this mode, or these two different modes, I'm going to use a metaphor. And the metaphor I'm going to use is that of a pinball machine. So if you remember how pinball machines work, you just pull back on the plunger, a ball goes bouncing around, and that's how you get your points. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that pinball machine and put it right onto the human brain. Are you ready for it? OK. There we go. There's our pinball machine on the brain. And this is our analogy for the focus mode of thinking. If you look at how close together those little rubber bumpers are. When you are, let's say, solving a multiplication problem, so let's say that you, you're um, solving 22 times 74, either writing it out or doing it in your head, your mind moves along the patterns you've already been learned, or you've already learned. But let's, so this works great for something you already know how to do. But how do you focus on and learn something you've never learned before? So let's say you know multiplication, you're nine years old, you're, you're beginning to learn division, 
you have your first division problem that you're trying to do. So you start thinking about division and you're thinking about it and but your mind kind of keeps slithering back up your thoughts towards multiplication because you're comfortable with that. You know that already. And as a result, you can't solve this first big division problem. You're sitting at home, you're reading the book, you're trying to make sense of it, you get more and more frustrated. Have you ever gotten frustrated when you're trying to figure out something really new? And finally, you might even close the book, walk away, but when you do that, you actually, as you walk away and start thinking about other things, your mind goes into that mind-wandering mode. And you, you're, you're thinking, but you're not aware of what you're thinking. But later, this is the, this is the magic, later, your mind is wandering, and you can't think in that careful, focused way that you can in the focus mode. But when you later return to focusing on the problem, suddenly you can find it makes sense. So this diffuse mode, taking a little break and kind of thinking in a different way, it can be, it might be that uh, you go and have dinner, or you work on something completely different, or you sleep on it that night. But when you return, that's when it suddenly makes sense. The, the interesting thing is, again, your mind, when you're learning new things, you're learning, you, you go into focus mode, then you go into diffuse mode, and you're going back and forth between those two modes. You've been taught that the only time you're ever learning is when you're focusing. But you're also learning when you take these little breaks. You, uh, the mind, you can't be in both modes at the same time, on the same topic, unless you're taking certain forms of mushrooms, and I am not advocating that here. But, um, what I'd like you to do now is I would like you to take a tiny break and I would like you to turn to someone you don't know who is near you, introduce yourselves, uh, give your name, uh, kind of what, your, uh, what subject area you're particularly interested in, and then uh, describe, one of you can describe what's the difference between focused and diffuse modes, the other can add corrections or additions. Let's take uh, four minutes on your mark, get set, go. Did you feel it when, when you took this little break and you turned, as you were turning to one another, you were momentarily in the diffuse mode. Did you feel how it was kind of like, oh, a relief, I don't have to focus, I can take a tiny little break. Oh yeah, let's chat a little bit. And it, it actually helped with your learning. So hopefully you might have gotten some ideas and questions that you might ask uh, as we get towards the end here. But I would like to bring up probably students worlds, right around the, all around the world, their worst problem in studying involves one thing. Let's see if you agree. Procrastination. <laughs> okay. So, why do we procrastinate? It turns out that if we even just think about what we don't like or don't want to do, it activates a part of the brain, the insular cortex, that experiences pain. So what do we do? We, we think about something we don't want to do, and so we, we think, oh gosh, but I don't want to do that. So we turn our attention to something more interesting, and the result is we feel happier almost instantly. We do this once or twice, no big deal. Do it very often, and you can even end up thinking, oh, you know, everybody else at UFM in this program, they're better than me, I just can't do this. And you can end up not being successful, not because you can't do it, 
but because you've simply procrastinated. And few people can learn when it gets really stressful as you procrastinate. So I'm an engineer. Let's just jump to what is the most uh, successful tool to help you avoid procrastination. It is something called the Pomodoro Technique. How many here have heard of the Pomodoro Technique? Okay, so a fair number, maybe a third. Okay, this tool, I get thousands of emails from all around the world, people telling me, I learned about this tool and it is the best. It made such a difference in my studies. And this was invented, this simple tool, by an Italian, Francesco Cedillo, in the 1980s. All you have to do to use the Pomodoro technique is first just turn off all distractions. So you're tempted to have a little bit of stuff going on in the background, listening to a television, uh, maybe friends are talking, and you, and you might have little pop-ups on your cell phone, that kind of thing. Everything should get turned off. And then you focus for, you uh, set a timer for 25 minutes, focus as intently as you can for those 25 minutes, and then here's the magic. The magic of the diffuse mode. You take five minutes and you reward yourself with a break but you do not pick up your cell phone. Why? Because as soon as you pick up your cell phone, you're like, I'm just gonna look at that. Then you're returning to focus and you're gonna overwrite what you've just learned. You need to give time, just five minutes, for that diffuse mode to work its magic. Might seem a little boring, might, but if you want to really kind of assimilate those, that information you've just studied, taking that five minute break is gonna be super, super helpful. So that's all there is to the Pomodoro technique. Now some people like to do like four Pomodoros. The first three are followed by five minute breaks. The last one, maybe a half an hour break. This technique, if you use this, there's all sorts of Pomodoro timers uh, that are available online. So look for some of those. A really popular one is something called Forest, um, but you can find many different ones. Okay, so now, very quickly, I want to cover working memory, long-term memory, and octopuses. So, so you have two major forms of memory in the brain. There's working memory in the prefrontal cortex in the front, and there's long-term memory scattered all over the back. And working memory, you can kind, it can only hold a limited amount of items. So like four pieces of information. So you can see our little octopuses representing working memory. And uh, it's got four uh, arms on it. What happens is when you're learning something, so you want it to go, that information to go into long-term memory. And long-term memory is scattered all over the brain. It's what's in long-term memory. It's those sets of neural links that you've learned through retrieval practice. So as you're learning, what, what is happening is your, like your little attentional octopus is the, the working memory is trying to put together links as you're learning, and it wants to put those links you've learned into long-term memory, and then later, when you need those links, you can retrieve them out. So, so you can use them when you need them. This brings me to our younger daughter, Rachel. Interestingly enough, as you will see in this video, Rachel is not necessarily the best driver. In fact, this morning, they just, she just contacted us and she slid off the road in the ice and the wheel came off her car. So you will see in this video what kind of driver Rachel actually is, although maybe not quite as dramatic as that, because she's gonna model for you what it felt like for her when she was first learning to back up a car. So watch her little face as she's trying to back this car up. She's like, oh, uh, 
do I look in the front mirror? Do I look in the side mirror? Which way do I look? Do I go this way again? So you can see why this morning's accident uh, happened the way it did. But anyway, so learning how to back up a car is actually, it's really hard. And so what Rachel was doing as she was trying to learn was her little working memory was trying to figure out how those links worked and she had what's called a heavy cognitive load. And she didn't have any you know, arms on her octopus available to do anything else but learn what she was learning. But once she learned how to back up a car, all she had to do was think, you know, I want to back up a car. She could pull those links to mind. She has a light cognitive load, and she actually has other, you know, those extra arms available to kind of think about, well, what's on the radio, or is my seatbelt fastened, or whatever. When you're learning something, you are, um, what, let's say that you are learning something for a test. What you want, and what your, your professor will want, is that when you go to take a test, you've used retrieval practice, all through your studies over the coming months. And when you sit down to the test, here's what's going on. Your little working memory goes, okay, yeah, that's right. Oh, my professor is trying to get me to get this technique combined with this and this technique, put them all together, got it. But if you don't use retrieval practice, what can happen is your, your working memory will it, you know, you sit down to a test, you think you've got all that information there, but you haven't retrieved that information to know, to give yourself little tests. And you sit down to the test, and here's what your working memory does. It's like, oh, wait, that information isn't in long-term memory. And you know what happens with students when they do that? They can tend to go up to the professor and say, you know, I really knew the material better than it showed on the test. Actually, you probably didn't. Or they might say, I suffer from test anxiety. Test anxiety is real, but a lot of times it's actually not test anxiety. It's that you haven't practiced using retrieval practice. So again, retrieval practice can be invaluable for whatever you're learning. As I'm closing, I would just like to bring to mind my favorite scientist of all time. His name is Santiago Ramoni Cajal. And Cajal was a terrible student. He was even worse than me. And uh, he was like kicked out of several elementary schools. He clearly had problems that are, uh, it looks like he's had dyslexia. He had attentional deficit disorder. He was really a problem student. And, and what he did was when he was almost 20, he said, oh, you know, I think I want to try and be a doctor. And, you know, he was such a loser. But he, he began to try to study. And do you know that he actually not only became a doctor, he became a professor of anatomy. And then he won the Nobel Prize. And then he's now known as the father of modern neuroscience. So here's this guy who's set to be a total loser, and he turns out to have helped us all, even carrying forth to today. And he was asked, you know, how, sort of like, how did a loser like you become successful? And he said, well, it was two things. For one, it was persistence. And remember, he was using retrieval practice. But the second thing he said was, uh, they said, well, you're a genius. And he's like, oh, I was no genius. And he had to work really hard to understand the information. But he said, I have worked with many geniuses. And the problem with geniuses is they can tend to jump to conclusions, and when they're wrong, they're inflexible, and they can't change their minds. So if you 
like Ramoni Cajal, are no genius, rejoice, because you can sometimes do things even geniuses cannot, and UFM will help you to spark that, that wonderful brilliance that is within your mind. Thank you so very, very much. <laughs>